Happy birthday to Final Fantasy 16, my favorite game of all time. And, based on the average quality, the game with the greatest boss roster ever. Yes, that's a very bold claim, but it's one I wholeheartedly believe, and I'm going to prove it with these next two videos. This is the first part of a two-part series ranking the bosses of Final Fantasy 16 from worst to best, including all of the DLCs. Though, worst to best sounds a little harsh. I prefer to call it most okay to most perfect, because this boss roster is absolutely stacked. I find every boss in this game to be fun in one way or another, so this list will be more positive in nature compared to others that have come before it on my channel. The list also won't be including any hunt bosses, with one exception, and any reskin fights will share spots on the ranking with commentary about the differences, for example Fafnir and Flame Lizard. And of course, this video will only be part one of covering a very large boss roster, so I'm not going to go too far into depth on the lower rankings. With all that said, let's begin the video, and let's find the flame. Number 36, Gigas. As I said, I like every single boss in this game in one way or another, and Gigas is no exception. He's a fun mini-boss with fair attacks, parrying practice opportunities, and a goofy design. Note what I just said though, he's a mini-boss. He's only promoted to boss status in the tutorial segment because he's the first big enemy you fight in the game, and thus he can't be anywhere else but the bottom of the list. This isn't the last we'll see of these promoted enemies though. Number 35, Control Node. Big balls don't make for the best bosses. Put that on a t-shirt. Control Node is a goofy little boss with nothing else really like it in the game, and I give it credit for that. It shoots lasers in various ways, it deploys AoEs, and it even has a scary purple bar build-up attack. Though I've never seen what it is because this fight is very very easy, hence why I've ranked it so low. It's a speed bump before you get to the better bosses within Reverie. Number 34, Tiamat. Call me a nerd, but when I hear Tiamat, I expect a powerful dragon monster, or at the very least a giant demon. This Tiamat though, he's just a guy. Waste of a cool name if you ask me. Mechanically, he's a fine boss, he's just a trained bearer, but I like fighting human enemies in this game, so he's a fine early game fight before you get better weapons and powers. Number 33, Republic War Panther. This is another mini boss inflated to main boss status, but it's a fun mini boss, so I give it a pass. These panthers attack fast, they can close distance with charge attacks, and they have sick roundhouse kicks. All these moves are fun to parry, and the aggression of this boss makes for a solid battle every time. What else do you want me to say? It's just a big cat. Number 32, Imperial Cannoneer and Akashic Cannoneer. Body positivity representation continues in gaming. First we had Godska Noble, and now we have the Imperial Cannoneer. These hefty lads have health equivalent to their bulk, and their attacks make them a hard task to cut down. This is another mini boss elevated to boss status with cutscenes, so you'll be seeing a lot of these cannoneers by the time the game is over. They shoot blasts from the cannon, they smack you with the cannon, and they turn the cannon into a flamethrower that lasts for a really long time. It's such an awkward battle taking these guys down. Their melee attacks feel awkwardly timed, and they have a lot of variety in their ranged moves. I haven't even covered all of them. The first one of these guys you fight turns a Kashyyyk halfway through the battle, recovering all of his health in the process, and that's a pretty cool spectacle. This is a well-designed enemy, just not one that I very much enjoy fighting. Number 31, Midnight Raven. If we wanted to talk about well-designed enemies that I don't like fighting, nothing sums that up better than Midnight Raven. Though, to be honest, it's less him and more the different versions of him we fight later in the game, with 10 times the move variety and 10 times the difficulty. I am bad at fighting these guys, I admit it. Out of my deaths in my first playthrough, 3 out of the 9 I remember came from fighting 2 of these guys outside Rosalith Castle. But, that's then, and this is now. For the 4th proper boss in the game, he's a solid step up from what's come before. He's quick and nimble, darting around the battlefield and attacking you with really weird timings. He does a lot of twirls to the point where I genuinely can't tell where the damaging part is supposed to be. He can call on lightning from the sky and fire from his mouth, and even a special assassinate grab attack, which is a bit of an odd name given the complete lack of stealth, but hey, who am I to judge? He's a solid challenge for the early game. The mid-battle and end-battle cutscenes and QTEs add flair to the fight, giving it a bit of spectacle that I very much appreciate, and that helps to elevate it above the rest of the list so far. Number 30, Curl. It's Republic War Panther, but instead of being a normal type, he's an electric type. How quirky. In seriousness, this boss is a big improvement over the first cat. He has lightning, as I said, but he also has a lot more unique and differing attacks due to those whip things hanging off his body, some of which can be parried and some of which can be permafrosted. I give props to the team for their creativity with these cats, it's a definite step up in quality and challenge from the normal panthers, and by the time you fight them in the Rising Tide DLC, you'll have your work cut out for you, especially if you get caught in their blaster attack, that thing will shred you. 
Again, standard mini boss elevated to boss status for one stage, but it's still a great fight. Number 29, Phoenix vs Ifrit. This is a fantastic ending to one of the greatest openings to a video game I've ever played. After witnessing the Imperial attack on Phoenix Gate and the death of his father Elwyn, Joshua primes into Mega Ultra Chicken and goes a little out of control. Clive sees this as well as a mysterious hooded man, and before we know it, here's Ifrit. The two icons clash, creating the game's box art, and we see the destruction those beasts can create. The castle is set ablaze while the massive structures underneath are ruined and torn apart by their fury. The phoenix heals itself again and again while trying to wear down Ifrit but it's no use as the demonic icon gets the upper hand and slaughters Joshua as Clive begs it to stop. It's awesome to watch this unfold. But how is it to play? Well, kind of basic, because as the phoenix all you're really doing is dodging Ifrit's lunges, aiming a circle and spamming the shoot button over and over while occasionally doing a QTE. It's fine and fun for the first time you do it, especially as the phoenix mechanics do come up later again in the game, but I can see why the developers give you the option to skip the entire prologue on repeat playthroughs. The Phoenix vs Freed battle is an incredible spectacle, it has awesome storytelling and the music is absolutely godlike, but I'd be perfectly happy never playing this battle again. Number 28, Necrophobe. Yet another mini boss as a boss, but this one gets the benefit of being one of Ultima's thralls. It's creepy, uniquely designed and a genuine challenge. It uses a sword, both for melee and as a catalyst to launch its energy attacks, and I find its moves kind of hard to read. Even spamming precision dodge doesn't matter if he catches you in the middle of the animation. Adding in various elemental magics only adds to the variety that this boss can bring, and getting the parry on him feels so satisfying. So while this may not be my favourite fight in the game, I do have to commend it for how unique it feels. Number 27, The Undertaker. On the other hand, this mini boss as a boss is, and I quote, a big fun doofus to fight. His moves are simple, relegated mostly to charges, lasers and stomps, and they're all easy to read and to avoid, but I just highly enjoy taking these guys down, unleashing all my best moves and combos on them, and enemies stepping all over them like I'm a dominatrix. Or Bayonetta. I don't have much profound to say here other than it's a great enemy to test out this wonderful combat system on, and I very much appreciate that. Number 26, Supana and Shirada. This is the first proper Clive-focused boss battle in the game where you can really feel the stakes. Tiamat was weaker than you, we were never going to actually kill Jill, but fighting these two harpies right after their master took out a semi-primed Zid? This was an intimidating prospect, but one that turned out to be very doable. These harpy lady sisters attack with melee and wind blasts, with cinematics separating the phases of the battle, and they prove a good challenge for the early game. You don't really need to worry about being ganked or overwhelmed too much because the one you're not focusing on will stay fairly passive in my experience, so this isn't a frustrating fight. It's a good lead up to Benedicta, and one of the first bosses in the game that really made me sweat on my first playthrough. Number 25, The Dragoons. Um, actually it's Night of the Blinding Dawn and Night of the Dying Sun. Oh look, it's a mini boss as a boss. We haven't seen that for a while, but the Dragoons are actually kind of awesome. Their armor designs are badass and their fighting styles are interesting. Obviously they jump to Kingdom Come and crash back down to penetrate you, but some of them jump once, some of them jump twice, and some of them clone themselves for several impacts before the real thing comes back down hard. I find all of their grounded attacks pretty hard to read as well, so the Dragoons are a solid challenge whenever they appear in an enemy wave, and as a boss, they're pretty good too. Number 24, Fafnir slash Flame Lizard slash Shridemar. This is actually a unique boss enemy, and I've described it in my notes as Big Doofus Roly Poly Lizard. It's true though, these things are like Sonic the Hedgehog with their signature moves, and the rest of their moveset is mainly throwing around their bulky bodies. They're fun to fight, don't get me wrong, and the flame version in Drake's Breath, the Flame Lizard, adds a few more unique elements to keep the fight fresh. Even better is the Rising Tide version, Cridemar, easily the hardest variant in the game with several toxic breath attacks and area denial toxic slime making him a fight you really have to focus on, but in a good way. These lizards get the thumbs up from me. Better than that other lizard anyway. Number 23, Shiva's Dominant. The first non-prologue boss you'll fight, it's the mysterious Shiva's Dominant, who looks suspiciously like Clive's silverhead childhood friend from 13 years ago. A shame these characters only seem to recognize each other after the bloodshed. Jill has a fun moveset to deal with, invoking her ice and her sword, and her music theme is absolutely beautiful. It's a shame that we don't get to fight her at her best considering she just went around with Titan while she was primed, but she's still a solid fight for the game's opening, even better on Final Fantasy mode. Number 22, Iron Giant and Aurum Giant. 
It's one of the last mini-boss bosses in the game, and it's my favourite of the lot in the base game. These hulking brutes swing their swords, invoke lightning, and shoot Getuga Tenshos at will. And they hit like giants made of iron or orum. It's just that these movesets are a lot of fun to fight against. A lot of my enjoyment from these battles is just how easy it is to permafrost dodge or parry his moves. They're telegraphed near perfectly for counters like that, and it adds to how much fun I have shredding these guys down to size. Don't get me wrong, if you screw it up, it hurts like hell, so these giants are not a pushover. But I won't deny the sheer thrill and feeling of power I get from tearing one of these guys apart. Number 21, Angra Mainyu. When I hear the name Angra Mainyu, I expect a colossal in-game super boss embodying all the world's evil. Not a floating eyeball goofy boy, but this fight is a very solid one. Once again, it's a mini boss elevated to boss status, and this takes place in the first paid DLC of the game, so that would normally be a mark against it. But this thing gains entirely unique attacks and mechanics, so don't think you're getting a straight reskin. Angra Mainyu can clone itself, create cool area denial attacks like this ground roulette, and even combine them both for a pretty tricky puzzle to solve during a high speed battle. By the end of the fight, there's a lot of attacks to keep track of, and it definitely makes for an engaging DLC level battle. When I was writing the script, Angra Mainyu actually jumped up several spaces in the ranking, going from 29 to 21. So I think that speaks to the care that the developers put into what could have simply been a reskinned boss. Some games could really take notes. <laughs> Number 20, Malboro slash Akashic Malboro. This is the true boss of the prologue. 15 year old Clive taking down a Malboro was one of the highlights of that tutorial section, and the rematch against the Akashic version was equally badass. Fighting a moving mass of tentacles is easier said than done, given they move erratically, have little wind up in their movements, and a lot of variety in their tendril attacks, such as them coming out of the ground at seemingly random. A criticism I have of these guys though is their bad breath attack. Functionally, it works perfectly, and it will kill you in moments if you get caught in it, but it inflicts no status, because, well, we don't have status in Final Fantasy XVI. It's a strange complaint I know, but when I fight one of these vegetables, I expect to come away dying of every disease under the sun and also to have been turned into a frog. Still, that hardly takes away from the enjoyment of the fights, and I think they use the Marlboro really well in this game, sparingly enough to be seen as a legendary beast. Number 19, Sleep Near. As we move into Act 3 of Final Fantasy XVI, this suave smarmy swordsman is the first big boss to face us. He lives up to the hype built up throughout his few appearances in the game, proving himself as a great swordsman who wields a fraction of Odin's power. Partway through the fight, he whips out Gungnir and just goes insane, letting loose all manner of devastating attacks from the sky and ground, most of which I managed to dodge on instinct or panic. The sheer amount of attacks he can summon is intimidating, and a lot to deal with on the fly providing that spectacle that I've praised so much without even needing cutscenes. His confidence and taunting throughout the fight gives him a lot of character, and the battle stays engaging the whole way through. It ranks among the more demanding fights on the list in terms of mechanics and difficulty. Sleepnir is a fantastic knight type fight, and he's a worthy entry to kick off the top half of the list. Number 18, Garuda. Our first proper icon fight appears on this list, and we're only just now entering the top half. That should speak to the sheer quality of this roster. After Clive steals a portion of Benedicta's power, she doesn't take that very well, and turns into the Bird Woman, proceeding to summon a storm that threatens to rip apart the entire forest. We end up battling this beast on a flying rock, and it's a solid battle. Despite being a large beast-type enemy, Garuda feels great to fight, none of her attacks are bullshit and it's actually very easy to engage her in combat. There's no hitbox problems here that I've experienced. She has various attacks involving her claws and her command over the winds, and it can get pretty tense at times especially towards the end of the fight when she summons giant tornadoes. She's also the first boss that we fight after obtaining Garuda, our second set of iconic powers, so she serves as a prime target to test that new grapple attack against. Whether it's your first playthrough with two icons, or your second playthrough with three, her difficulty is solid all around. Not too taxing, but enough to be engaging. We whittle down her health bar and finish her off by a cool cinematic. Wow, that was... pretty... easy, actually. I thought it'd take more to kill an icon- Oh shit! Well... Guess we should have seen that coming. As you may have guessed, the only way to defeat an icon is with an icon. And lucky for us, we happen to have one. Oh yeah, it's time to wake up, Ifrit. This scene was jaw-dropping when I first saw it, and it still gives me chills to this day. We then partake in the first real kaiju-esque fight of the game, Ifrit vs Garuda. Now to be fair to the man, Ifrit has just woken up after 13 years. He's a little sleepy, and it shows in his moveset. Ifrit moves slower and simpler than he will in later fights, and he has no special moves yet, and this part of the battle is more for cinematics than actual gameplay, 
but it's still absolutely awesome. This fight is not a guaranteed win either. If you screw up your dodges and timings, Garuda can mince your health bar, especially on Final Fantasy mode. As the battle continues and escalates, Ifrit throws Garuda around like a ragdoll. The icons tear each other apart and regenerate. The environment is destroyed, and it ends with a point-blank hellfire right to Garuda's face. It's absolutely amazing, and while it may not be the most engaging fight to play, it's highly elevated by the coolness factor, and combined with the solid first phase, this is easily in the upper quality tier for Final Fantasy XVI. Number 17, Liquid Flame. This fight was in the lower half of the list for me at first, but upon replaying it, I was pleasantly surprised that it's much better than I remember. You fight this beast in a circle of ice created by Jill, which is a pretty cool spectacle in of itself, and the fight itself is a mechanically interesting one. Initially, this thing just decides to MMA your ass, fighting in a manner similar to Urizen's third fight from Devil May Cry 5. This is a very parryable phase, seeing as I didn't even actively learn to parry until beating Barnabas in my first playthrough, and I knocked this thing's blows aside near constantly. Despite being a creature of fire and using fire-based attacks, the Liquid Flame doesn't resist your Phoenix powers at all. Good thing too, seeing as you'll only have three icons at this point in the base game. Phase 2 is where things get really fun. The flame morphs into various animals to attack you, and that's a very cool mechanic. Being set upon by a flaming curl or having fire rain down upon you by an infernal bird. And they require a bit of effort to avoid, especially seeing as there's multiple of them that attack in sequence during the 11th hour attack. He sits there and lets you attack for a little bit after he's done while he recovers, so there's a reward for all that dodging you have to do if you survive. The biggest complaint I have is just how little Jill does in this fight despite being primed and in the background. I know she's an ice type fighting a fire type and she's the thing stopping us from being cooked to death by lava, but come on, this is her moment. Let her fight alongside us or get the finishing blow or something. At the very least, seeing her skewer Imran like a bitch was very satisfying, and a solid conclusion to her character arc. Number 16, Akashic Dragon, White Dragon, and Svarog. It wouldn't be a fantasy, and definitely not a final fantasy, if there weren't dragons in there somewhere, and these are pretty great ones. They carry all the attacks you'd expect, big melee and fire breath, but it's the unique magics that they employ that make these fights stand out from each other. The Akashic Dragon has a lot of different fire breath attacks that make use of the long straight coverless arena. The White Dragon has portable AoEs and lasers that block off your movements, as well as an ungodly amount of other ice-like projectiles. Both of them have a move called Dragon Dance, which is by far the most deadly part of the fights. It usually amounts to a ton of things to avoid while they themselves are unhittable by most means. I know that I said earlier that hunt bosses wouldn't be included on the list, but I want to give a special shout out to Svarog. He's a dragon, and the highest leveled enemy in the base game, and he's a very tough fight. He employs a whole arsenal of completely unique attacks, making me really wish he was a boss in the main game because fighting a dragon of this quality mandatorily in the story would have been awesome. And his scariest move is what he uses at low health. It's called Last Dance. It's a truly terrifying attack where he throws everything he has left at you, plus the kitchen sink for good measure. The positive is that this really is his last dance. If you survive that, the fight is all but yours. These are wonderfully designed dragon fights. Eat your heart out, Dark Souls 2. The only downside I can think of is a couple awkward hitboxes and targeting issues. Never lock onto the head. You'll just hit air for about 50% of the fight. Number 15, Ifrit. I know a lot of people who say they're fighting their demons, but now we're taking it quite literally, and it's awesome. This is the second massive big thing we're fighting as normal Clive, and it's probably the biggest in the game in that regard. You can cut away at Ifrit's ankles or Phoenix shift up an aerial combo on his face, either one works well. Just be wary that you're aiming at the right places with your iconic strikes or they will miss and you'll have to wait for the cooldown. Ifrit's attacks are all simple, but still cool. When he's not attacking with stomps and slashes, he'll be utilizing fire and fast projectiles or destructive AoEs, and Shiva dodging the Crimson Rush ability feels so damn satisfying. Despite not being the most complicated fight in the game mechanically, Ifrit is still a very fun one with high story significance, and I'm glad he was put in Cairo Skate as a way to fight him again more easily. Number 14, Ultima from Drake's Spine. After being harassed by this bastard for most of the game, we finally get a chance to hack and slash Ultima down to size. The fight with him in the interdimensional realm is a very cool and ominous battle, but it doesn't quite compare to the one later in the game. I get that he's meant to be way beyond our level at this point, but he still feels too tanky. It takes ages to whittle down his health bar even with a damage focused build. Of course, he doesn't have that problem. Tons of quick lasers and flames will cut Clive down in seconds, and when you're fighting him at the end of an arcade mode run, it's a very tense encounter. It's a shame that this fight is so overshadowed by the one later in the game, but this is still a very solid boss as it is. 
hence why Ultima's Drake's spine form is in the top half. It's a very fitting finale to a pretty great stage. Number 13, Behemoth. In Final Fantasy VII, Meteor is summoned by a small black rock. In this game, it's summoned by a giant cat-dog monster thing. It's ridiculous, but it's awesome. It even gets a mid-boss cutscene dedicated to it where the Rosfield brothers combine their power to shatter the Meteor and then continue the fight. How awesome is that? They could have just punched it, but you know, not all of us are bald. The Behemoth has a fun physical moveset as well as the magic, including a move where it drags its face along the ground on its way to attack you, which I find pretty goofy in a good way. It'll summon a lot more meteors, sorry, comets, throughout the fight as well. None of which require a QTE cutscene, but they do make for pretty demanding area awareness in order to avoid the damage. The Behemoth can even summon highly damaging tornadoes, as if he wasn't already powerful enough. Of all the pure beast bosses in this game, the Behemoth stands out as easily the best, and I'm seriously impressed by how much effort and flair went into what could have easily been a throwaway boss. Number 12, Sigma. We come across the first DLC boss, Sigma. What is that music? Shut up! There will be no copyright claims here on this day. This automaton is a beast. It's clear that they learned lessons after they made the Iron Giant so beatable. Sigma is so much faster and hits so much harder. His moveset reminds me of Liquid Flame, but even more aggressive and much scarier. Sigma's ability to close distance is very intimidating, and the sheer level of combos he can perform could mean that one slip up from you will spiral into a quick and painful demise. Then, because of course he has one, he has a super scary final phase ultimate attack called Fulmination. Do you think you have enough energy blasts coming out of the floor mate, or did you want a few more? The creativity of Sigma's attacks, the pressure he puts on you, and the difficulty spike compared to most of the base game bosses all work together very well to land this automaton very close to the top 10. He really is a true Sigma. Number 11, Hugo Kupka. The fight with Hugo is a great climax after a long build-up. In today's world where the message of revenge bad is pushed more and more, it's awesome to see Clive and Hugo lay down just how much they hate each other and then fight to the death with all of that rage. Kupka is semi-primed and wields the power of the earth against you, mainly by manifesting enormous fists to crush you with. He darts around like a super-powered boxer trying to punch you, or he'll just launch the fists at you like projectiles, because that's a thing he can do apparently. He's more susceptible than a normal boss to Shiva's dodges, or ironically, his own icon's parry. So Final Fantasy mode makes this battle even more fun, which I feel is a statement that applies to every single boss on the list. In the second phase, we take this fight to the basement, and Hugo breaks out more of his flashy attacks. In addition to more dangerous strikes, he has so many ground eruption attacks that he'd make a ground-type Pokemon blush. Sometimes he'll swim through the earth like Scrooge McDuck, sometimes he'll turn the earth spiky with a stomp, or he'll bust out his ultimate move, Earthen Fury, one of the scariest moves in the game coming from a humanoid enemy. Hugo may not quite reach the top 10, but this is an awesome grudge match that provides endless entertainment and cathartic satisfaction. And I think that's a pretty good place to end today's part of the list. Apologies for cutting off right before we get to the top 10, but I want to give each boss its due respect without bloating the video length to ridiculous proportions. With that being said, the top 10 section of this list is likely going to be longer than all of the previous entries put together. Stay tuned for that in a couple of days, not 4 months. I'm so sorry I did that. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and consider checking out my Patreon if you think that I've earned it. Leave your thoughts on the game's bosses in the comment section down below, I'd love to hear all about them. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time.